Texas men's basketball shows signs of improvement. Will Zion catch up the job for the rookie of the year? And do you believe in miracles? All this and more on College Crossfire. All right, let me explain why Andy Judge is getting it. You can boo me all you want, but I want to see the UCF Knights in the playoffs. I want to see them. The New York Yankees. Yeah! Oh, no! dollars. We're robbed. Okay. Take a bow. Take a bow. This is all chaos. Two, one. Welcome back to College Crossfire, the hottest debate show on the 40 acres. I'm your host, Zach Leff, and tonight we have an excellent show planned for you with an even better panel to discuss the topics. So, let's meet the panel right now. On first base, we have the defending champ, Jake Herman. Jake, how does it feel to be back on the show? Feels great. You know, raised a banner, collected my ring from last week, ready to raise another one. Well, there it goes. <laughs> on second base, we have John Kelly himself making the first appearance of the semester for him. John, how you doing? Good, you know, I was runner-up last semester in the Tournament of mm -hmm. Champions. I'm looking to start this semester strong and go forward to the end. Well, let's see. And on third, we have the rookie himself right now, making his first ever TSTV appearance, Sam Berm. And Sam, how you doing? I'm good, I'm good. I'm happy to be here. Hoping the Berm can replace the Herm on top oh, of this Oh, a little rod right there. I like it, I like it. But thanks, guys, <laughs> and good luck right now. We're going to move on to some Texas basketball right now. Well, a week ago, I told y'all that Texas absolutely had no chance to make the NCAA tournament. However, they must have been watching because since then, the team has gone on a three-game winning streak and most recently defeated number uh, top 25 ranked West Virginia, who they lost to earlier in the year by 40 points. So, what has caused the Texas men's basketball resurgence? Anybody? Yeah, well, when you talk about this team last, you were right. It looked like they had no chance to make the NCAA <laughs> tournament. And the reason I think that they put themselves back in a position to compete for, you know, at least an outside chance of maybe getting into the tournament, still unlikely. The reason is defense. All, all season long defense has been the strength of the Texas Longhorns. Uh, they're a top 30 team in the country in defensive efficiency. Then they don't score a lot. So they rely on the defensive side of the ball a whole lot, as Shaka Smart's teams traditionally have. When Jericho Sims went out, it looked like the interior defense was more of a turnstile than any kind of a defense. That has completely changed. Over the last three games, they've done a nice job. Will Baker, Royce Ham, and Brock Cunningham, of all unlikely heroes, have stepped up and really put passion and effort into the defensive end of the floor, and it shows. They've held quality opponents down in the paint. Yeah, definitely, you know, people having to step up, like you said, Brock Cunningham and Will Baker. Will Baker having that huge game last week against TCU, definitely a big plus for Texas. Anybody? I personally I think it was the Iowa State loss. After that loss, it was devastating for Texas. Uh, never at any point previous in the season had the booing and just the general dislike of this Texas team and Shaka Smart been louder. And similarly to how the Ravens reacted to the loss to the Browns this past season, they went on to win 13 games after that. I think this spurred a spark in Shaka Smart and the team to you know, put their heads on the court <laughs> and went out some games. Yeah, no, definitely. You know, Iowa State for sure was a turning point for them. Went on that three-game winning streak. Sam? That's right. Uh, I got to agree with John here. I think uh, it kind of lit a fire under them, that Iowa State game. But I got to say, Courtney Ramey had a great game, that Iowa State game, and he's been playing really well in tandem with Andrew Jones. So I'm really excited about this duo, and if they can keep it going, uh, there's hope for us. Yeah, no, definitely Andrew Jones and Courtney Ramey, that guard play in sports, huge right now. So I'm going to say the score after this question. We have Sam with three, John with two, and Jake with two. So now we go with – now we have three games left before the, tour, uh, before the Big 12 tournament. The Longhorns will have a chance to improve their NCAA tournament resume. On top of that, they also will be able to possibly position themselves better in the Big 12 standings. So what does the Texas have to do to finish the season on a high note? Uh, win. I mean, <laughs> pretty simple, right? There. Personally, I don't think there's any way they're going to make the NCAA tournament. Oh. Mm. Uh, I think they're definitely going to go to the NIT tournament, which, again, I personally don't think is worth anything at all. Not important tournament. Correct. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not important. Uh, but I mean, they have to win because uh, next season they're going to be looking at this. Uh, Shocker Smart trying to hold on to his last shreds of his job, mm -hmm. and you can't come back if you don't win. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely a good chance they might get in the NIT tournament, but they won that last year, and fans didn't expect them to go back to the NIT this season. 
Sam? Uh, I really I think they got to rely on the three ball. Uh, in these past three games, they've been hitting north of 40% on their three-pointers. And in their two past two losses, they've been shooting under 30. And that's key for them. I think that's part of the reason why Jones and Ramey are doing so well. But without it, I think we're going to go cold on offense, and it's really going to be difficult. Yeah, for sure. You know, shot selection has been an issue with them all year. They are a big three-point shooting team and not necessarily the best, but the way they've been shooting the ball lately is definitely an improvement. Jake? Yes, yeah, Sam, I like what you said about the three ball because Texas is a team that has lived by the three this year many times. They've also died by the three. So this is a team that should not be relying as much on the three-point shot, I think, as, as fans would like them to. The one thing this Texas team needs to improve on if they're going to pull off a miraculous tournament berth down the stretch is rebounding. Even in their wins over TCU and Kansas State, they were torched on the glass. They gave up 19 offensive rebounds against Kansas State. They were out-rebounded by 12 against TCU. Those aren't even top rebounding teams in the country. That absolutely can't happen. And so if you're Texas and you're going to rely on this efficient defense to close teams down, you can't just give it away by giving up second chances because Oklahoma, they're going to kill you with those second chance points, with those kickouts. So I think Texas needs to improve on the glass if they want to have any chance at pulling off the wins necessary to get back to the NCAAs. Yeah, rebounding has been a big concern for the Longhorns in Big 12 play, and it's shown over some of their losses. After that round, we have Jake with five, John with four, and Sam with five. Now we go on to some baseball. Over the past weekend, the team started, uh, stayed perfect and swept Boise State in a three-game series. The team now stands at 9-0 and has a big weekend ahead in Houston where they will be taking on ranked opponents LSU and Arkansas. So my question is, what has been the key to Texas's winning ways so far? Anybody? Uh, to, be, to be perfectly honest, uh, they've been playing easy teams. Uh, you know, Rice, Boise State hasn't had a baseball team for the past 30 years. Uh, but on top of that, I think they have some, they have a really new team, fresh faces. But they also have some really strong uh, upper class uh, leadership, Zach Zubia, DJ Petrinsky, Bryce Ellis, just to name a few. And I think that combination with their leadership caused the keys to winning these past couple weeks. And it'll be the keys to winning moving forward. Yeah, no, definitely that, uh, you know, they did have a week schedule to start out the, the year, and they'll be tested this weekend, definitely in Houston. Sam? Yeah, uh, I'm really excited about their pitching. Uh, Ty Madden and Pete Hansen particularly have looked fantastic. Uh, Pete Hansen, I believe, with a no runs earned yet through 10 innings, and Ty Madden with a .6 ERA with 15 innings. Uh, clearly, LSU is their first big test, but with the exception of that five-run game against Boise State last weekend, they've looked fantastic on the mound. Yeah. Yeah, the pitching has been excellent for the Longhorns, Jake. Yeah, pitching's been excellent. And, you know, weak schedule or not, when you're undefeated, you're undefeated. And there's something to be said for that. And I think some of the reason that Texas has been able to pull out these close games, whether or not you think they're closer than they should be, is that they're making contact when they have runners on base. Last year, they fell victim to strikeouts and double play balls and just inopportune hitting. This season, we're seeing them scratch across runs, manufacture a run by moving a guy over, getting a sacrifice fly, scoring on a fielder's choice, just doing the little things, playing that style of small ball that will propel you to win even when you don't hit two or three home runs in a game. Yeah, that small ball has definitely been an improvement for the Longhorns compared to what they were last year. After this question, we have a tie score of seven across the board. Ooh. Moving into our last question of A block right now. From baseball to softball we go. The Longhorns were undefeated this year until this past Saturday when the team would drop their first game of the season against the Duke Blue Devils one to nothing. Yesterday, the team split a doubleheader against the Louisiana Raging Cajuns. So, what is the biggest takeaway from the Louisiana games? Anyway. Uh, I got to give a lot of credit to Miranda Ellis here. Uh, she had a great game in the first game, even though it was a tough 2 1 loss, getting on base and pitching and only giving up two runs there. And then closed out the second game with the shutout and the save, which was huge for that team because clearly in those games they struggled to put up the runs against the number 10 team. Yeah, no, definitely some key pitching in those games for the Longhorns. Yeah, you hit on it. Great performances in the circle. Um, from both from from Ellis and all the Texas pitching staff, and that's going to be huge because this team travels to take on number one over the weekend, and it's going to take a little bit more run support than two runs in one game and one in another to 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 get it done. And I'm I'm going to be looking at the ladies in the middle of that batting order, particularly Mary Iacopo, big 0 for 6 during that doubleheader. Would love to see her get it going like she had early in the season when the team travels to Los Angeles. You know, definitely a big test this weekend against the number one team in the country, John. I think it just goes to show that, you know, this team isn't infallible. 
Uh, they've gone on a great run, uh, one of the best runs in school history. Uh, however, uh, it was the number 10 team, uh, so not such a terrible loss, especially for a team as good as Texas. Uh, as Jake said, the real challenge will be tomorrow against L uh, UCLA. Uh, yeah. Number one. Yeah, number one. I mean, that's definitely going to be a tough test. A big one of the Longhorns are able to pull out a win. That would be big for their resume right now of the season. So after this round right now, we have Sam with nine. John and Jake both have eight right now. When we come back, the panel debates which Longhorn football star will benefit from the combine the most and select which team will win the MLS Cup in 2020. Welcome back to College okay. Crossfire. Let's quickly re remind everyone of what the score is right now. We have Sam with nine, John with eight, and Jake with eight. So you know what that means. It's still anybody's game, people. So tomorrow, the NFL Combine will start its on-field drills and will showcase the skills of the best college players in the sport. Four Longhorn players, wide receivers Colin Johnson and Devin Duvernay, defensive end Malcolm Roach, and safety Brandon Jones all receive invites to the Combine. So... Which, which invited Texas prospect has the most to gain from the combine? Jake, we're going to start with you. I'm going to go ahead and say Colin Johnson here because here's a guy that had these high expectations, right? He's projected to go maybe late first round, early second round by some experts' calculations before the season started, but he endured a disappointing injury-riddled season with the Longhorns, and now is his chance to remind everybody of the physical gifts and raw ability that had them so excited in the first place. So I think... Contingent on the fact that he is healthy and he's able to show off his full route running ability, full speed, full vertical, his great hands, that he'll be able to remind everybody why they were so excited about him. Yeah, no, definitely. You know, he came into the year as one of the, considered one of the top receivers in the country because of those physical traits, but injuries definitely plagued him. So tomorrow could be a big time for him. John? Uh, this is a bit of a hot take. I'm going to say all four of them. Ooh, okay. Uh, you know, uh, Going into the season, Texas was widely talked about, but unfortunately we kind of tapered off in the national conversation. And there are a lot of other schools that, you know, scouts and teams were looking at more closely. And I think because of that, this NFL combine is going to be really important for these two, four talented uh, players because uh, they might have not have been watched as much during the season. Well, watch. Some of, some of those players earned their way in. Some of their players already had chances of getting in. But if you could just give me one name, what name would you say? Uh, Colin Johnson. Colin Johnson as well. Okay, Sam? There you go. Uh, I'm a big fan of Devin Duvernay. Uh, I think he's been underrated all year, uh, fourth in the country in receiving yards, and in this draft class, first in yards after the catch. Uh, I think his physical gifts are really uh, undernoticed right now, and I think this is his chance to prove he's got that speed, and he's definitely got that leg strength that uh, people look for in a receiver, especially a shorter guy. Yeah, no, definitely Devin Duvernay, a guy who had an excellent year, who earned his way probably into the combine, unlike Colin Johnson, who was already presumed that he would be there. And Devin Duvernay definitely has a lot to prove tomorrow, especially with the physical intangibles. This is a tough one here, but I'm going to give it to Sam, because I do think Devin Duvernay could find a way to, you know, really build up a stock tomorrow. A guy whose numbers are there, but people want to see it on the field. So, Sam, you're going to get the point there. We move on, though, to now basketball. For the first half of the NBA season, the Rookie of the Year award looked like it was locked up by Memphis Grizzlies guard John Morant. However, in January, preseason favorite and number one overall pick Zion Williamson returned from injury, and his impact was felt immediately in less than 12 games played. Williamson put up staggering numbers leading to this debate about the award. So my question is, John Morant or Zion Williamson? for Rookie of the Year. Sam, we're going to start with you for this one. Yeah, uh, i got to say John Moran still. I think Zion has played fantastically, and that is not a knock on him at all. But it's still way too early to tell. You know, This could totally be just a hot streak. Not that I'm, count not that I'm discounting anything he's done so far, but Jaw has been consistently fantastic throughout the year and looks like a great player that the Grizzlies have picked up for years to come. I'm really excited about these two together in the league. Yeah, no, definitely John Moran has really just been excellent all year, and he's continued to even with Zion Williams in there. Jake? Yeah, so Zach, I know Sam's in the lead, so I want to come in and disagree, right? I want to argue for Zion Williamson here, but I can't. He hasn't <laughs> played enough games. It, John Morant is a guy that's played a full body of work. He has his team overperforming from where they really should have been. I mean, the Memphis Grizzlies are in the hunt for the eighth seed in the West. Nobody could have seen that coming, and it's in large part to the play of John Morant, who really had a case to maybe make the all-star game this year out of nowhere. A, a rookie that's really 
probably over the last three years, has the biggest upward progression of anybody in the game of basketball. John Morant, for me, is the rookie of the year. Zion hasn't played enough games. That's fair. I mean, John Morant has been great. And like you said, he really has improved the team. A team in the Grizzlies who are picking two and no one probably thought would have a chance at the playoffs right now. John? I'm going to say Zion. Oh. Okay. He hasn't played a lot of games. However, the games that he has played have been exceptional. Mm-hmm. Like, really good basketball. And I think going on through the rest of the season, uh, uh, you know, we'll see him continue to perform well, and I think he'll eventually outshine Ja. Yeah, no, I mean, watch. I think a big thing that you all are saying right now is that Zion Williamson has not played enough games. Do you, what, what part, how many games do you think it would be appropriate for him to miss then if, he, if Zion was to be, you know, have a better chance at this race? Do you think it's like if he only missed about 20 games or so, 30 games, what would you say? Hmm. How many games do you have to play, like 50, 60, you would think? Yeah, I would say uh, Ja looks like he's played a little over half a season at this point, and he's put up these numbers. If Zion puts up similar numbers, you know, there's still plenty of time left to keep his numbers up and get those games in. But if he does this over half a season, I would give the Rookie of the Year title to him. Mm-hmm. I just think he needs the time to prove that he's consistently yeah. able you to You guys agree, like, at least half the year you'd have to play, you'd say? I, I would say probably, probably more than half the year. Okay. Um, I think you should have to play a majority of the games to, to win the award. I mean, Kyrie Irving... He's a guy that's put up amazing stats in his limited time. He wasn't an all-star. Well, A, because he was injured. But <laughs> even if he had been playing, he wasn't an all-star because he didn't play enough games. Exactly. It's a similar logic, right? Yep. Uh, personally, I don't think it really matters how many games you play. I think if you look at the team's performance with Zion and without Zion, if there's a noticeable difference in how the team overall performs, I think he definitely deserves that award. Yeah, watch. Well, all great points. I think if Zion played a little more, I think he'd definitely be a strong contender with Ja, but I think it's just too little, too late. I'm going to give the point to Jake here because I do like the point about how he's really improved this Memphis team, a young Memphis team, and you can clearly see that at the point guard position they needed a guy like Ja Morant to really put him over the top to get him in that playoff run. So, Jake, you are getting the point there. We move on now to some soccer. Last season, the Seattle Sounders won the MLS Cup against the Tor- against Toronto FC 3-1. The 2020, 2020 season starts this weekend with some excellent matchups on display and the addition of two new teams, Nashville SC and Inter-Miami, the CF, which is David Beckham's team. With the kickoff of the season on the horizon, who do you guys believe should be the early pick to win the MLS Cup in 2020? John, we're going to start with you. I think the LAFC still have it. Yeah. I mean, Bella. they've got the best players, they've got some of the best coaches, and their management team is really strong. And in the MLS, uh, that's all you could really ask for, uh, and I think that will help them keep up their performance yeah, and win the championship. Yeah, the L- L- LAFC last year made a big splash in the MLS. Definitely had a nice rivalry right there with the Galaxy, and they do have a really good structure and nice ownership that believe in the organization. Sam? Uh, I'm going to say NYCFC. No, mm-hmm. they, they don't really have any big stars anymore, but they have a great team culture and made a very solid run in the East, and are definitely looking to build upon that run. I'm very excited to watch this team, which is very young and still relatively new, but they've looked good throughout their time in the MLS so far. Yeah, no, definitely, like you said, don't have the necessarily the big star, but with these young guys, they might be able to make the push in the East there. Jake? I'm going to go ahead, uh, stay in L.A., but go on the other side of the El Trafico rivalry and go with the L.A. Galaxy, a team with one of the best histories in the MLS. And I think they get back this year in a similar principle to what my beloved Washington Nationals did, addition by subtraction. It might sound crazy to say that a team gets better for losing a guy like Zlatan Ibrahimovic, (laughs) but really it wasn't a great fit. It was not a great fit with the L.A. Galaxy last year. This year they bring in a guy in Javier Hernandez, Chicharito, who will will make a nice impact for them. They have great management, great supporting defenders. L.A. Galaxy. Watch. I mean, L.A. Galaxy is another great choice. All great choices. But I'm going to go with the other side of El Traffic. I'm going to go with LAFC. So, John, you are going to get the point. I do like what they showed last year. I think they can make a big jump even more this season. So we have, after this round, we have Sam with 10. John with nine, and Jake with nine. It's still anybody's game. When we come back, the panel debates the best way to root against a cheating team and discusses their favorite Texas sports robbery. Welcome back, and now it's time for the rapid fire round. Let's quickly recap the score. So we have Sam with 10, John with 9, and Jake with 9. So remember, it's anybody's game. And remember, each question in this round is worth two points. 
So it's up for grabs, folks. Okay, on to the, on to the next question. After a scandalous offseason, the Houston Astros headed to spring training knowing that the critics and Mockingbird would be surrounding them all at all times. The team actually removed signs from, from, the, uh, from fans that trashed the team and scorned them for their actions. So, in your opinion, what is the best way to shun a cheating team's ways? Look, baseball, one of the all-time greatest things to do is just, you know, calling out and just, you know, uh, making fun of the players as they're going out. It's a little heckling? Yeah, heckling. It's one of the best pastimes in baseball, and I think especially uh, with the specific situation with the Astros, that's one of the best ways you can get back to the team. Okay, I like a little heckle. Can't complain there. Anybody? Oh. Uh, you first, Jake. I think for a for a limited edition broadcast of Houston Astros baseball this year, their feed, their fan, their oh, I hate punishing the fans for a team. Maybe the replay feed. The Astros replay feed should consist of nothing but the catcher signs. That's all I get. <laughs> if, they want, if they want to challenge a play, they got to trust their first viewing on live because they wanted to look at the catcher signs on the camera in the dugout, and that's what they get. Wow, just the signs. That's it. That's a good way to find those signs out. Sam? Uh, well, if I'm going to a baseball game where we're playing against the Astros, uh, I'm definitely bringing in my home trash can. <laughs> uh, just a small one, you know, does not cause any security threats. Very easy to get through. And I like <laughs> to play the drums, you know. I like to think of myself as a percussionist, and I think a couple of bangs might throw them off here or there. Um, well, you know what? Those were all great answers. Definitely to get back at those Astros. But I'm going to give it to Sam. I do like the, the trash can, the little banging of the drums, you know. Give them a little taunt and give them a little taste of their own medicine. Of medicine. So, Sam, you are going to get the points there. We move on now. This weekend, the Houston Roughnecks and the Dallas Renegades face off uh, against each other in the XFL. Texas is the only state with two XFL teams. This might become the newest robbery in Texas. But what is your favorite in-state robbery in the state of Texas? Anyone? I don't like the first game, but I'm a Fort Worth man. I, you know, Eamon Carter is my hero. TCU, SMU. Fort Worth, Dallas, two cities. People generally put us together, put them together, but they really hate each other. They're two very different entities, and that football rivalry uh, definitely supports it. And at the end of the day, it's all in good fun, but it's a as a rivalry, it's a great way to battle out differences. Yeah, no, but for the skillet, I know, little horned frogs, little mustangs, that is a great robbery right there. Uh, I'm going to go with the uh, Texas NBA rivalry. Okay. These teams over the past two decades have been fantastic. Uh, the Rockets and the T-Mac and the Yao Ming years, you know, the Tim Duncan, Greg Popovich, San Antonio Spurs, and the Nash, Nowitzki, Doncic, you know, Dallas Mavericks. They have all been competing against each other pretty much for our entire lives. And I love the rivalry that they've set off. Yeah, it's definitely each other. nice. They have, unlike the XFL, two, they have three teams, exactly. so there's always that consistent rotation over rivalry, especially with different teams going in and out of the playoffs. Jake? So, so your rivalries are, are great, no complaints, except they don't have the history, the pageantry, the competitiveness, or did I say history? I said history <laughs> of my rivalry. It just seems like one team sort of seems to dominate the other based on the time of year, maybe even just the time of day. In Texas, I'm talking about the rivalry between the warm weather and the cold weather. I, I'm just like, every, every day, have you ever woken up, it's been 40 degrees, later that day it's 75? It's just, it, it's a rivalry as old as time, and it's as competitive as ever. <laughs> definitely out of the box, <laughs> definitely the answer. But I'm going to give it to a more un another unique answer as well. I do like the SMU-TCU rivalry. Why not show a little love to another college rivalry? We all love college rivalries. They're some of the best in all sports. So, John, you're going to get the two points there. We move on now to the last question. Last Saturday marked the 40th anniversary of the Miracle on Ice game, where the under uh, the uh, underdog USA hockey team defeated the previously unmatched Soviets in the semifinals of the 1980 Winter Olympics. The team would the team would eventually go on to win the gold medal at Lake Placid. Many regard this as again, this win against the Soviets as one of the greatest upsets of all time. But according to you guys, what is truly the greatest upset in sports history? I gotta get my mind off the weather. Give me a second. <laughs> exactly. Anybody can help it. You know what? I'm gonna say. You know, similar in uh, fashion to the Miracle on Ice, 
the 1972 World Chess Championship between <laughs> Bobby Fischer and uh, return champion Boris Spassky. While the Miracle on Ice showed that America had the physical strength over the USSR, uh, the 1972 World Chess Championship showed that we had the mental strength over the Soviets. And I think, you know, those two combined uh, really helped us in the popular war against the Soviets. Hmm. Yeah, another another Soviet-U.S. robbery right there. Not hockey, but chess. I like it. Anybody else? Uh, I've, I've got a personal interest in this one, but I'm going to have to go with the uh, 20 Champions League victory for my, my very own Chelsea FC. Uh, we were up against a Bayern Munich team who was thought to be the best in the world at the time. And we were a bunch of scrubs finishing sixth in the league that year that had no place being there. Uh, went down to penalties. As we all know, that's a 50-50 chance. And we came out on top thanks to some brilliant play by our goalie and our striker, Didier Drogba. It was a beautiful moment for 12-year-old me. Some tears may have been shed, uh, but very, very happy with that. There it is, a personal moment right there. Got to love it when it's even more personal to you. I mean, definitely an exciting way to end the game, especially in PKs. Jake? Hmm. I mean, in terms of upsets and greatness, it doesn't get much more publicized than NCAA March Madness. Every team comes in. If you've watched no college basketball the entire season, all you see is a team with a 1 next to them and a team with a 16 next to them, and you think, well, it's a foregone conclusion. And so that's why I'm going to pick UMBC over Virginia as one of the greatest sports upsets of all time. There may have been upsets, like, like in soccer, where there are other factors going in that make a team more or less competitive than another, whether one club is richer, one club has you know the higher paid players, or, or one club is bigger and stronger on paper. This is a team that was a juggernaut versus a team that nobody had ever heard of. And so that's why I'll go UMBC over Virginia. Watch, wow, so those are all great answers. Personally, I would have said my New York Giants over the New England Patriots in 2007, <laughs> but None of you guys answered that, but I do like your answer, Jake. I do think a 16 versus a 1, we've never seen that. We never thought it would happen. Teams have come close, but UMBC was able to do it. So, Jake, you were getting the points, but it was not enough to win. The winner today is Sam hey. Berman. Hey. Sam Berman, the rookie, he gets his first win. Do we have enough time for FaceTime? We do not have enough time for Facebook, but we will get some on Facebook. Well, you know what? Congratulations again, Sam, to our, to our winner, Sam, by the way. Thank you for tuning in to the show tonight. Be sure to check out the 1-0 Sports Show on Fridays at 9 a.m. and College Press Box every Monday at 9.30 p.m. for the latest sports news on the 40 Acres. Be sure, uh, don't forget to follow at TSTV Sports on social media. And for all the panelists and people in studio and master control, have a wonderful rest of your week. Welcome back in to College Crossfire. Tonight was an excellent show, and our winner was the rookie himself, Sam Berman. So Sam is lucky enough to have some FaceTime. Sam, take it away. Uh, yeah, I just want to thank everybody for letting me on here tonight. Uh, also, Big Herm over here, letting me be the erm at the top of the table <laughs> next week. I'm very excited about that. And to John for giving a good competition out there today. Uh, happy to be here. Can't wait to be back next week. We are happy that you're going to come back next week because all you guys – did a great job tonight. I was very, very happy. So that's it for our show. Thank you for tuning in to College Crossfire tonight, and have a great rest of your week. Woo! Yeah.